Welcome to season three of Through the Word. We hope that this podcast will serve you as you grow to know and to love the Lord. Welcome back to our podcast of Through the Word. Thank you for joining us this past season and for Pastors Josh and Matt for joining me so many times in this podcast. Thank you. This is exciting because this is our final episode of this season. So the end of season three, I believe. This is hard to believe. Yeah. We're syndicated now or something. I don't even know what that means. Oh, all right. Well, we're not going to get into that. baby. No, this, is, this has been an exciting journey in the book of Genesis, and we've decided to take a break for the summer after this week for July and August. We have a whole new preaching series coming next Sunday, and then in the fall, presumably, we'll get back into the podcast once again. So welcome again to our final episode of this series of podcasts in the book of Genesis. If you're not there, let's look in Genesis chapter 29. Uh, Pastor Josh, you spoke from three full chapters on Sunday. That's right. Is that a record for you for the number of chapters in one message? <laughs> Good question. Probably. Yeah. Man. Yeah, that probably is. Unless you've done a whole summary of one book in one message before, but yeah, maybe it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. We dug into a lot, and so here's our first question. Maybe Esther, eh? Maybe we did Esther in one once. Maybe. That's, but anyway, uh, yeah. Sometimes we do long form. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the first question. Real simple. Mm-hmm. Why three chapters? Hmm. Why did you tackle so much in one message last Sunday? Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, if I think we did do Esther in one setting, one sitting once, and it would be for the exact same reason: is is just trying to find a, a narrative unit. And so this is just a, a good thing to be thinking about. Maybe is for people as they're learning. We're all learning to study our Bibles. Is we're, we're used to dealing with chapters twenty nine to thirty one in little segments, and that's good, and there's fruitfulness to that. And um, but we're looking for textual clues to what the Lord intended to be what we would call a narrative unit, a story, which is always, of course, going to be a story within a story. On the one hand, we've got a story that begins in Genesis and ends in Revelation. And then we got a story that begins Genesis chapter 1 and ends Genesis chapter 50. And then we got a story, but there's stories within stories. But uh, this unit, we're looking for what are the clues. So biblical stories work much the same way as the stories you're used to learning from and listening to and enjoying movies and books and that is all stories have a singular point of tension Hmm. in all stories the tension has to be prolonged and usually escalating or else we get bored there is no story without tension it's just information so it's usually escalating it escalates to a point of climax where we say you know, are, are we going to get through this? Is the is the antagonist going to win, hmm. and our protagonist going to fail? And um, and then there is some form of resolve. Either it resolves well, at which point technically you would call that a comedy, even if there's no laughing in the story, and mm-hmm. or it resolves poorly, at which point you'd call it a tragedy. tragedy. And then the story's done, and the. The point of the story is generally brought right to the surface in the climax, and we go, oh, I see it, I get it. And so here we're looking for what's the narrative unit, what's the the tension, and I think it's this question of is God really with Jacob and how is he with Jacob as he's in this time in Padan Aram with him and watching over him. And and we see it escalating throughout, right through to the end where Laban's like tricking him, and now he's on the run, and Laban's running him down. And and, and then we find our resolve there in the climax that God really was with him and Mm. watching over him the whole time. And he assures Jacob of that, and Laban goes home, and and Jacob returns to the promised land. So, So that's just a little tip. As you're reading your Bibles, particularly narrative passages, and most of the Bible is narrative. Hmm. Yeah. Look for those clues of what is the narrative unit and ask yourself questions about who's the protagonist because I'm supposed to see myself in their shoes. The protagonist is not always a good guy. It's just right. the main character. And, yeah. and uh, what, what are they up against? What's the antagonist? And it may not always be a person. It may mm-hmm. be a thing. And um, what's the point of tension? Where is that tension resolved? What's the lesson that I'm to capture in the midst of that resolution? Yeah, that's really good. So in this big story here, we have Jacob and yeah. Laban yeah. and the two ladies. That's right. Rachel well, and Leah. And, four and plus two more. <laughs> Bill right. and Later. Zelda. Yeah. Later. Yeah. 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 Maybe yeah. those would be sub characters, perhaps. Or That's true. They but... actually become technically the the word would be foils. Uh, okay. A foil sheds greater light on the the primary characters. Helps you understand them better. Yeah. And like you're saying, if if you just read a section of that story, like a little scene. 
uh, you can understand really, really important things and take away uh, important sort of like moral lessons. Yep. But if you think that's the whole point of the story, you miss out. It's, yeah. it's just like if you're watching a movie and you stop 10 minutes in and say, yeah. what did that 10 minutes teach me? Yeah. It's going to tell you something, but it's not the story. Mm-hmm. It, you might glean something, but it's not the overall focus of God is watching over him. Yeah. That is the, the thread that runs through to the climax brings right. resolution. And again, there are stories within stories, and yep. the stories can have their own resolution. So there is value to be had, as you say. Yep. From And I'm not even arguing that it would be, I'm not saying it would be improper to study just chapter 29 or just chapter 30. Yep. But but there's a reason why we yep. did it the way we did. So the, one of the stories within a story here is Leah. Yeah. So we, we understand that Jacob loved Rachel first and primarily. She was the more beautiful one. And yet there was the bait and switch. And Leah was all of a sudden the first wife. Um, and that, you, you spoke on that so well on Sunday. But there's an interesting verse here. Uh, Rachel uh, was the beautiful one. She was the most loved. Mm-hmm. But, but Leah was not loved as mm-hmm. much, for sure, by Jacob. And yet verse 17 of chapter 30 says, mm-hmm. God listened to Leah. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's an interesting story within a story here of God maybe favoring the less loved. The overlooked in this text. Do we have anything to say about that in this story here? Yeah, and 3017 is an echo of 2931. It's the same idea. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive. So he saw her, he listened to her. And so here obviously, as they've married Jacob, they have joined the people of the promise. Mm. Leah and Rachel become matriarchs. Jacob's Mm. become the patriarch. Mm -hmm. They become matriarchs. And so God is with them and watching over them in a special sense, just like he does all of us as people of the promise. That is his promise to us. They've joined in that. And there is maybe an extra special way in which the Lord watches over some of those who are um, overlooked, who are oppressed, who are mistreated. And we see that idea coming out in the Lord's treatment of Leah. Uh, our hearts go out to her. Yeah. Now, uh, I mean... There, there is a point she at which you might say, trickery, though. Yeah, Leah, right? you know, you could have at the altar said, psst, like I'm, I'm not, not the one. The night of, you could have said, hey, Beak. hey, yeah. <laughs> so she's in on it. Look at my own. eyes. And that's right. That's right. The, the eyes you didn't like. The I eyes know. that weren't so lovely. I yeah. Know. yeah. Uh, so she is in on it. She's, yeah. But this is an important lesson, too, because just recognize this. It is not our moral perfection or our moral goodness that has God, and then us being trampled on by others, that has God like in an extra special way watching over us. It's just his heart, Mm -hmm. his compassionate heart. There's not really a lot redeeming about Leah here. Mm -hmm. But we still, our heart goes out to her that we say, how hard would it be to be in a marriage and you're not loved? Mm -hmm. And and God says, yeah, no, you caused a bunch of that, Leah. Uh, He doesn't say that, but we can see that. But God says, "Uh, but uh, but I hear you, I see you, I remember Mm -hmm. you, and I'm going to bless you in this special way. And so she's having these... These, these boys, the Lord's allowing her to conceive, and they become important boys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you think back to even uh, Jacob's own life, he's born as sort of like the second brother mm-hmm. yeah. who is not favored by his own father. Right. Yeah. And then this story is cast in, in a very similar light where the, the patriarch favors one over the other, mm-hmm. but God sort of chooses the one who's overlooked to really be the, the main source of blessing to the people of God. So she's the one who's going to bring forth Levi and Judah, like you mentioned yeah. on Sunday. These yeah. these really significant boys who then are the heads of tribes, who then take on both uh, the role of king and priest to all of Israel. Yeah, pretty significant. It's Fair. a pattern the Lord shows Fair. us all throughout Scripture, isn't it? Yeah, uh, David wasn't the one that you would have chosen from that yeah. list of brothers, and on mm-hmm. and on it goes. So yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, well, he wouldn't choose any of us. Except for his grace. That's that's the lesson, isn't that's it? That's exactly right. Yeah. There's yep. nothing lovely in us nope. that God would choose us to love love nope. us. It's just mm-hmm. him. It's nope. his character. Nope. Yeah. So we talked about Leah. Let's now talk a little bit about Rachel um, it, by extension through chapter 31. Look with me at verse 17. Um, there's a fleeing from Laban. Jacob is trying to escape after Laban wants to hang on to him. You know, no, no, you stay. Jacob says, no, I want to be free. I have my, my wives and my family. Let me go. Anyways, verse 17, Jacob put his children and his wives on camels, and he drove all his livestock ahead of him, along with all the goods he had accumulated in Padan Aram, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. 
When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household gods. Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban, Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him he was running away. So he fled with all, his, all he had, crossing the Euphrates River and heading for the hill country of Gilead. So, interesting little story here where Jacob had gods. And we would immediately say, what? He has the, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at his disposal. He's walked and talked with God. He hasn't wrestled with him yet, but it's coming. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and he knows the, the Lord God Almighty by name. Yeah. Why does he have gods? And, and his wife, yeah, Rachel, has stolen these. Yeah, and, what is this yeah. supposed to teach us about idolatry in the family, in the, in the, the family of God in this time? Yeah, the, the, here's one of the challenges of dealing with so many chapters all at once is we couldn't get to this section in the sermon, and so I'm glad we yeah. can get to it in the podcast. It's a concerning piece. Yeah. What, why is Rachel, this matriarch of the people of the promise, stealing her father's household gods, these false idols? And, and clearly it's showing us that there, there is this lasting idolatry and this lasting lack of understanding of this God they're in covenant with. And so why does she steal them? Well, some people speculate that perhaps she just wanted them for her own power. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people say perhaps she wanted them because earlier uh, Laban finds out by divination that he's being blessed because of God's blessing on Jacob. Mm-hmm. So. She may have stolen them because she doesn't want Laban to be able to use them to find something else out by divination, which of course would be divination of a demonic power somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, as some people have said there may be some things about the, the, the holder of the household gods uh, was the one that also possessed the sort of birthright, the inheritance. Uh, I read that somewhere along the way. Even there you'd say, well, that's not trusting your inheritance is actually with the Mm -hmm. Lord now Mm -hmm. and leaving that behind. You you think I need to hedge my bets. Mm -hmm. It's all hedging bets. And so it's a problem. But remember, Leah's, uh, or sorry, Rachel's Rachel. married into this family. Yeah, She's been there 14 years now, which is actually no short amount of time. Think about somebody who's place their faith in the Lord for 14 years, we would expect that they're off the milk and they're right. beyond things like idolatry. Right. And yet, think of how easily idolatry creeps into our own hearts. Mm-hmm. She's human. She's wrestling with things that we're used to wrestling with as well. And the Bible's just really honest about that. And, and she lies too. She steals the household gods and then she lies. You remember yeah. Jacob's like, or sorry, Laban's there and he's like, I, I want to find out who's got him. And Jacob actually is foolish. He says, if any of us have him, they should die. Yeah. He put his prize, his boo bear Rachel, as we <laughs> called her on Sunday, puts her on the line, which reminds us of something that happens in Judges later. Yeah. And we're, we're holding our breath. Like, What's going to happen? Laban's going to find these gods and, and, and Rachel's going to die. And, and yet she sits on them, mm-hmm. hides them under her, lies and says that it's her menstrual cycle is happening and she can't stand up in his presence. And, yeah. and, and he's just is content with that and moves on. So uh, it just reminds us, she's like us too. There's an awful lot of sin in all of us. Yeah. In some way, uh, Jacob's journey is a bit like exile. He's removed from the promised land, mm-hmm. off in this foreign country that has its own gods and its its own ways and its own people, right? And just like Israel in exile, you think of somebody like Daniel, or you even think of a character like Moses, right? Uh, somebody yep. who's off out of the land, yep. but receives God's blessings. God is watching over him. He is with him. But just like Moses in, in the Exodus, when they leave to return to the land, uh, mm-hmm. it's not long before the Israelites leaving Egypt bring something of Egypt with mm-hmm. them, mm-hmm. and literally the gold, but then use that gold to craft it into an idol. There's yeah. something about us, I think even as Christians, we're, we're in this world, but not supposed to be of it. Uh, but so often we sort of like bring these little syncretist, syncretistic mm. hang-ups yeah. that we just continue to bring back to life. Uh, we, we are happy to leave the kingdom of the world, but we want to keep its little gods with us. And it really causes us to reflect on our own hearts. For so I don't sure. think this chapter really tells us too much about what Jacob did with those gods. No. If he found them. Yeah. But there's good evidence to know that even though they were from Laban's household, Jacob now has them in his household. And presumably, the rest of the story, in, in the Judges especially, shows us how much the people of Israel eventually would get into idolatry. Oh, yeah. And how much they were judged for that. Yeah. It's, it's no surprise to us why God would continuously tell his people 
to live in a way that's separate from the world around them. Don't yeah. take wives from the world around you. Don't pick up their, their practices. Yeah. Don't mingle with them. Uh, be separate. This is, you know, we see all throughout the first, the, the Old Testament in God's covenant with them. Separate yourselves from the people around you because you are so prone mm -hmm. to picking up idolatry. And the same call to us, but in a different way. We're not to, you know, form communes of Christians or whatever because we're to be in the world making disciples. Uh, but but we need each other. We need to keep coming back into community, and, and we, we, we need the help of the Holy Spirit searching us. Yeah. We need the continuing, ongoing refinement of God's Word and the things that He brings into our lives and each other to rid us of the idolatry we're constantly picking up, mm -hmm. which is not always, obviously, it, it would almost never be a graven image in right. our setting. Right. It could be, though. There are people who have Christians even, you know, whose faith's in Jesus, and yet somehow... They haven't learned you shouldn't have a Buddha in your house and right. like, like smash that, get rid of it. And mm -hmm. but, but beyond that, it's the idolatry of the ideologies of this world. Mm -hmm. It's the idolatry of the things that this world esteems and says it is worth your pursuits, your highest pursuits. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we pick that up so easily, yeah, so do. subtly, and we're, so that we are in possession of idols in our tents. The finger we point at Rachel, we find out that there's three of them pointing back at us. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Exactly. Even though we don't have these physical idols, uh, we certainly are a culture that worships images. Yeah. Hmm. Some of us may be sitting on the main source of images in our life, or maybe it's in our pocket. But yes. That's right. Yeah. Yes. yes. Digital, digital often, idolatry these days, yeah, right? Yeah. Often worshiping images. Yeah. So as our final question for today and for this series of podcasts, we thought we would just take a moment and compare Genesis 12, the beginning of the covenant, with these three chapters, because they kind of mark the end of a significant portion of the story mm. Yeah. Mm. in Genesis. Genesis 12, uh, the Lord said to Abraham, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. Mm -hmm. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. There's the short version of the covenant. Uh, we know there's a little more than that as, as time goes on, but how would you compare that with what we see in these three chapters? Yeah, we see Jacob's growing in greatness as God watches over him, a greatness on a lot of levels. Yeah. But uh, certainly we see in an obvious way, how often do we see the patriarchs, the Lord is enriching hmm. physically. Hmm. And, and Jacob is the same here. He arrives at Padan Aram with nothing. Hmm. Yeah. And he's leaving with, you know, it, the, the text is clear to, to make clear that he's, he, he's got all kinds of flocks and herds and camels and, and, and people. And so, yeah, um, yeah so he's, he's being made into, uh, you know, a great nation. A nation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we see this idea of God saying, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. Well, Laban finds out he's being blessed because of God's blessing on Jacob. This is yeah. why he's like, don't go at the end of the 14 years of service for the his daughters. Don't yeah. leave. I'm getting rich because of this relationship we have here. And also by the end, he realizes, I can't curse you. Yeah. God's like, do not say anything to Jacob, good or bad. And Laban's like, what can I say? What can I do? Mm. Uh, somehow, Jacob's saying, what do we have that's yours here? I haven't taken anything from you. And Laban's looking around and he's going, well, the daughters are mine and the grandkids are mine. and actually, Right? And yet he's like, but what can I say? And what can I do? I cannot curse you. Yeah. He knows yeah. if he curses Jacob, it will be for his cursing. And so right. we see God's hand of protection. Yeah. And then, of course, it says, all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Jacob is leaving with Judah, who is the head of the family line mm -hmm. of the 12 tribes through which Jesus Christ himself is going to be born mm -hmm. according to his flesh. And so uh, we're, we're seeing the continuation of that portion of the promise as well. Yeah. Those 12 descendants who will be the tribe, uh, the tribes of Israel, those descendants that God said, like, Abraham, look out to the stars. These will be the number of your descendants. And we move from Abraham and Sarah with nothing, <laughs> no one, right. yeah. uh, to at least here, uh, 12 descendants, male descendants, who will be able to have many more children. And uh, right. we see that just unfold very, very quickly. Wow. Mm. especially once we're in Exodus and beyond. But then I think like you're saying, out of Judah comes our Lord and from him comes a, a people that he has called his own. And there are millions, billions of, of those who have followed Jesus throughout history. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's very beautiful. I, I appreciate the end of the story here, the end of chapter 31. Uh, well, this part of the story anyway, where Jacob and, and Laban are having this conversation. And uh, we, we remember that Laban was really, really poorly acting toward Jacob. Mm. He did so many bad things, even though Jacob himself was a deceiver. We know that too. Uh, but in the end of it, we see perhaps uh, a little bit of grace in Jacob acting toward Laban where verse 30, uh, 53, part way through, it says, So Jacob took an oath in the name of the fear of his father Isaac. That's the name of God there. He offered a sacrifice there in the hill country and invited his relatives to a meal. Well, that's all Laban. Hmm. That's everybody, mm -hmm. I assume. Mm -hmm. um, and after they had eaten, they spent the night there. Early the next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. And then he left and returned home. So it's sort of like the Last Supper, in a sense. <laughs> with his family blessing them before they separated. But I, I appreciate that about Jacob. It seems like he is doing the right thing. He's taking the high road here as a patriarch in the nation of Israel and blessing those yeah. uh, perhaps who didn't bless him as much. But I appreciate that about, about Jacob here. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so should we. Uh, we should take the high road. We should uh, do what's right even when it's hard. And that's what Jacob is doing here for sure. Even after all those years of deception and working hard and being cheated, he's, it seems like he's praying to the Lord and making offerings and still worshiping the Lord, even in a hard time, and doing right by those around him. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we need to operate in, in our faith in Christ too. Yeah. So let's uh, end the podcast here today. Thank you for joining us this day. And Lord willing, we will see you in September. God bless. For more episodes of these podcasts, find us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Emmanuel Plus on YouTube.